Welcome everyone to the Sustainability and Education Research Institute. Uh, we're excited today to uh, host Connie Russell's talk called Intersectionality and Environmental and Sustainability Education, Connecting the Dots Between Sexism, Sizeism, and Speciesism. So, uh, Connie is a professor in the Faculty of Education at Lakehead University. Uh, she holds a BA in psychology with a focus on animal behavior and works in social services in Toronto and volunteers with various environmental and animal advocacy groups prior to returning to grad school to do a master's in environmental education studies and a PhD in education. She teaches courses in environmental education, outdoor education, social justice education, and proposal writing. She has long used intersectional analyses in her work including explorations, exploring the implications of feminism, ecofeminism, queer theory, fact studies, and critical animal studies for environmental education theory, practice, and research. Connie is the editor of the Canadian Journal of Environmental Education. She currently has two books in the hopper, The Fat Pedagogy Reader, Challenging Weight-Based Suppression Through Critical Education, due out in the spring, and the Environmental Education Reader, due out next year. So, welcome Connie, everyone, and, uh, and welcome also to our new guests who are just arriving here, just in time for the talk. Uh, a couple of seats up here. Uh, so, uh, yeah, our audience is just expanding, Connie, and uh, we're looking forward to your talk. Great, great. Well, thank you so much, uh, Andrew and Marcia, for inviting me, and it's wonderful to see a few familiar faces uh, that I've met at ARA, so this is great. Before I begin, I just want to uh, remind you or let you know that this is the first time I've done a guest lecture at a distance, so do bear with me if I mess up the technology, hopefully. I think we've got things working up, out, but we'll see. I've decided to do a traditional lecture, which is not normally the approach I take when I do something like this in person, but I think it might work best given I'm uh, a disembodied head. So we'll see how this goes, and you can provide me feedback uh, after. Also, I want to acknowledge that this presentation draws somewhat on my work with Aaron Cameron, who's a professor at Memorial University and with whom I co-edited uh, the forthcoming Fat Pedagogy Reader. And this presentation also draws heavily on a chapter I co-wrote for the reader with Carrie Semenko, who is a professor at Durham College. And if anybody would like a copy of that uh, chapter, I'm happy to send it to you later. Just uh, email me and I'll, uh, I'll send it on. So, let's begin. Did my slide come up? Yes. Woohoo! Excellent. Okay, I think we're going to be able to manage this. <laughs> so, you fat cow. How many women have had that insult hurled at them? Fat, thin, or somewhere in between, I imagine a number of you have had that experience yourselves or witnessed it. I'm using this insult as my jumping off point today. There is much to unpack in an insult like fat cow given its roots in fat hatred, sexism, and speciesism. And doing so illuminates the theoretical, pedagogical, and activist potential of intersectional analyses. In today's talk, I will be building on ideas from fat studies, gender studies, and critical animal studies. For the purpose of this discussion today, I will be mostly focusing on gender, species, and body size, although clearly consideration of race, class, sexuality, and ability also have much uh, to contribute. First, though, I want to situate myself a bit. I'm a straight, able-bodied, white, Anglophone Canadian. I'm a cisgender woman, and I grew up as a working-class tomboy on a farm in southern Ontario. I'm also fat, which those folks who've met me in person know that, but with the, my disembodied head, you may not know. Um, and over the years, I've been on the receiving end of fat cow, and I've also been called a pig, a hippo, an elephant, and a whale. Fun times. I'm telling you a bit about myself so you can have some sense of where I might be coming from. And also, I want to make clear that while I have experienced fat and class oppression, I'm privileged in really important ways, given I'm human, white, straight, and abled. Rather than wallowing in guilt like a pig over this privilege, I'm committed to spending my privilege, and part of that is through my teaching and research. 
In this presentation, I will begin by providing some theoretical context, mostly focusing on fat studies, since I think it's likely to be the least familiar body of work to this audience of environmental education researchers. I will then share some examples of the ways in which I've fattened my own work in environmental, humane, and social justice education. I will close briefly uh, by mentioning some of the questions I think this work might raise for environmental and sustainability education. And I'll do this all in 35 minutes so that we have plenty of time for discussion. So let's get going with a very brief introduction to weight-based oppression and fat studies. The images I'm sharing here will be familiar to most of you, I imagine. We are inundated with images that make clear what constitutes an ideal body in much of Western culture. Fat bodies like mine simply do not measure up. Rather, fat bodies are constructed as a major problem. Indeed, in 1997, the World Health Organization declared obesity to be a global problem. Obesity is now constructed as a disease and has been labeled a threat as dire as bird flu, weapons of mass destruction, and global warming. And those are messages coming from public health agencies. This isn't media. This is public health agencies saying these things. Its cause is said to be a sedentary lifestyle and poor diet. As part of the fight against obesity, the World Health Organization advocates the worldwide use of the highly problematic body mass index the BMI, which converts a simplistic measure of height and weight into a number that identifies one as either underweight, normal weight, overweight, or obese. But what is behind this alleged obesity epidemic? Is there any evidence for it? We commonly hear that we are getting fatter, yet for more than a century, at a population level, humans have been getting larger, yes, but not necessarily fatter. We also constantly hear that obesity leads to serious health problems, but significant research evidence to the contrary exists. In fact, fat people who engage in moderate activity have half the mortality rate as sedentary people at the so-called ideal weight, because it is fitness that has more significant health impacts, not weight. Further, much evidence suggests that it is more dangerous to be five pounds underweight than 75 pounds overweight. And weight cycling, that is losing and regaining weight compete repeatedly, which is something I've done uh, in my life, dieting and then gaining it back, that's, a, that's actually the growing health concern. And it causes far more damage than maintaining a heavier weight. So why do these myths about fatness and health persist? Well, to begin with the obvious, there's an awful lot of money to be made in having f folks worried about their weight. You can think here of diet food, weight loss programs, fitness centers, and the like. We are also marinated in what has been called dominant obesity discourse. This is a framework of thought, talk, and action where a size matters message fuels problematic biomedical narratives that suppress discussions of other dimensions of health, such as sociocultural contexts or health inequities. This discourse reinforces neoliberal rationalities of self-governance and personal responsibility rhetoric, i.e. it's my fault that I'm fat and uh, demonstrates my lack of willpower, my laziness, and my gluttony. Um, and this discourse privileges fit, thin, strong, trainable, and able bodies. So you can see here the connections to critical disability studies. The material impacts of dominant obesity discourse are disturbing. Weight bias has been shown to begin as early as three years of age, and research has described girls as young as seven stating that they need to go on a diet. You know, this is a time when, you know, kids should be, you know, growing, not dieting. Fat bullying in schools can lead to fat kids being teased, harassed, rejected socially, and can lead them to avoid school altogether, which is not a surprise if school is, you know, such a place of horror. Because of this, fat cat kids are at a risk for poor grades, depression, and suicide. In children, youth, and adults, weight-based oppression has been shown to predict low self-esteem, social isolation, poor body image, unhealthy eating behaviors, exercise avoidance, and weight cycling. Further, there's a whole whack of research that demonstrates that fat people experience discrimination at all 
multiple levels of education in healthcare and in employment. For example, fat people are less likely to be hired and they're certainly less likely to be promoted. Scholars working in a variety of disciplines and from diverse theoretical perspectives have come together in fields variously labeled as critical weight studies, critical obesity studies, and fat studies to interrogate weight science and investigate weight-based oppression. Educators have been part of this conversation and their work is now being called fat pedagogy. So that's a really brief introduction to fat studies. I recognize I just, you know, zoomed over a lot of material that you might have questions about, and we can talk about that later if you want. For now, let's turn our attention to the intersections of sizeism, sexism, and speciesism. Animal references used to stigmatize fat people, particularly women, are everywhere once you start looking for them. Amy Farrell, in her excellent history of fat stigma in American culture, illustrated well how fatness became a sign of, and I quote, inferior primitive bodies, a sure indicator of one's low position on the evolutionary scale, with the result that fat people are often treated as not quite human, i.e., we fat people are a devolution. And this image here is, you know, a flip on the traditional um, evolutionary uh, slides we often see that show progress to, you know, usually a white fit person. Irene Lopez Rodriguez analyzed English and Spanish animal words that are used to describe women. And she noted how words like cow, heifer, sow, in both languages imply fatness, dirtiness, ugliness, and promiscuity. While these fat study scholars have noted the negative connotations of being associated with other animals, very few actually grapple with the underlying speciesism that serves to make those associations so powerful. On the other hand, some scholars interrogate the links between sexism and speciesism, but fail to address fat phobia. For example, ecofeminists have done important work outlining the ways in which the domination of women and animals in, intersect in ways that profoundly impact both. Carol Adams offered a trenchant analysis of an image of a female pig reclining like a nude pinup model in the satirical magazine Playboy, the pig farmer's Playboy. And just in case none of you have had the pleasure of seeing it, such a magazine does exist. I saw issues of it regularly when I was growing up, both in my house in, and in lots of neighbor farm households. Pretty disturbing that uh, I think her, the pig's name is Taffy Lovely and that pig would have to be dead in order for that image to have been taken or drugged. In another example, Lorna Stevens, Matthew Kearney, and Pauline McLaren examined representations of cows in advertising, such as the Laughing Cow and Borden's Elsie, noting how these cows have exaggeratedly feminine features and they're portrayed as happy cows who serve to erase the horrors of contemporary dairy production. I contend that adding weight-based oppression into these ecofeminist analyses would further this really important work. Unfortunately, a few ecofeminists reproduce obesity discourse uh, when they're advocating for a vegan diet and citing that fighting the obesity epidemic is an additional reason to do so. There are, in fact, very few scholars who bring together gender, fat, and animality. Kristen Hardy is one exception, and she's a PhD student at York who's now working at the University of Winnipeg, or no, University of Manitoba. In Kristen's work, she describes a series of advertisements for a weight loss spa that depict the evolution of people from fat animals to fit humans. Note how all of these alleged pinnacles of evolution are not only thin, but also white and able-bodied. Hardy uses these ads to illustrate the dehumanization, or more precisely, the animalization of fat people. She argues, and I quote, to be rendered as animal in the context of a deeply anthropocentric system is to be marginalized in the most fundamental of ways. Hardy notes how such animalization has had profound material impacts. And as Manisha Decca makes clear, 
slavery and the treatment of indigenous peoples are, in her words, and I quote, but a sampling of the array of international instances by which violence was enacted against colonized human beings through the differentiating logic of animalization, racialization, and dehumanization. The animalization of women has had horrifying consequences. As Joan Denayer summarizes, doing so labels women inferior and available for abuse. This may be particularly so for fat women. Consider the bumper stickers and t-shirts that read harpoon fat chicks. And there's a new, you know, sort of online phenomena called harpooning. Or ponder the phenomena of hogging, wherein groups of young men competitively seek out fat women for sex. One particularly disturbing variation of hogging is called a rodeo, wherein guys will jump out of a closet or barge into a room at the heat of the moment, and they time how long it takes for the frat, fat woman to disentangle herself. Ariane Prohaska and Janine Gailey have done extensive research on hogging, and they argue that it should be called what it is, rape. Peppered throughout the excerpts of interviews with men that they share in their publications are descriptions of women as hogs, porkers, disgusting pigs, fat bitches, and road beef. Looking at these various examples, it is clear to me that analyses that probe at the overlap of sexism, sizeism, and speciesism can be very helpful in understanding and tackling such phenomena. Ecofeminism served as my own introduction to what some have called now intersectionality. Although ecofeminism fell out of favor in some circles because of the essentialist position some of its advocates took, and ecofeminism's contributions are often in erased in histories of intersectionality. I continue to find ecofeminism helpful because it does insist on pushing beyond the human. In the 2013 article, Sumi Cho, Kimberly Crenshaw, and Leslie McCall view the emerging field of intersectionality studies as a gathering place for open-ended investigations of the overlapping and conflicting dynamics of various oppressions, and they laud and encourage its widening scope. They argue, and I quote, it is important to consider the intersectional project a communal one, one undertaken not in academic silos, but in conjunction with fellow travelers, with shared insights, approaches, and commitments that guide our critique and collaboration for communal gain, unquote. While neither fat nor animality are mentioned by them, it is clear they are seeking solidarity with others committed to tackling oppression in all its complexity. So I want to turn now to a few examples of how I've taken up these ideas in my teaching. And I do so not to offer recipes, though you're welcome to borrow any activities that you want, uh, but to eliminate what this might look like on the ground. So to begin, even before I open my mouth on the first day of class, my body is already teaching. As I described in my Fatties Cause Global Warming paper in the Canadian Journal of Environmental Education, my fat body is far from the hard body of the stereotypical environmental and outdoor educator. Until about 10 years ago, I was generally mortified by this fact and simply avoided the topic of my own embodiment and hoped people somehow didn't notice. Now I'm determined to bring my embodiment out of the depths of the hidden curriculum and into the explicit curriculum. And I share my own experiences of being heavier in this field. I found that most students respond positively to me doing so, although some clearly are uncomfortable with me calling myself self-fat, given they see that word as a pejorative rather than a simple descriptor of a body type. I also share my own uh, experiences of privilege, particularly white privilege given my context in northwestern Ontario. I use written autobiographical assignments and in-class activities to help students unpack their own privilege. One activity I've used is a variation of the power of flowers um, activity, which I'm sure some of you have seen, where students create petals that represent their positioning on various hierarchical dualism. For example, male, female, white, non-white, thin, fat, human, non-human. 
What makes my variation of the power flower unusual is the inclusion of thin privilege and species privilege into the mix. I take great care in facilitating this activity and others like it, given emotions such as guilt and anger can run high. And I don't want to unwittingly marginalize any students, reproduce oppression, nor do I want to reify the very dualisms I'm trying to problematize. But for me, this activity helps demonstrate the complex interplay of identities and the structural underpinnings of oppression. And I also hope it catalyzes discussions on how students might address privilege in their own future work, whether as teachers or educators in other contexts. In asking students to unpack their privilege, I want them to go beyond the individual and make connections to broader structural forces at play. One activity I found helpful for doing that is the hegemony treasure hunt, wherein students seek out examples of oppression built into the very campus itself. The treasures they return with include photographs or descriptions of buildings that are next to impossible to navigate in a wheelchair, portraits of university presidents who are all white men, classrooms with chairs bolted to the floor pointing to a stage that assumes the use of lecture-based pedagogies, and signs that say no animals allowed. They also take note of classroom furniture that does not accommodate fat bodies, fat phobic and sexist advertising plastered on the walls, and the limited food choices available in vending machines and cafeterias. Another way I help students link the individual to the systemic is through media analysis and production. Given the attention to body image and much media literacy work in Ontario elementary and secondary schools, most of my students seem to have little problem identifying fat phobia in traditional and social media. As I said, we're marinated in it, it's easy to see. What they are sometimes less good at is making connections between fat phobia and other oppressions. One activity that I found helpful in doing that is one I've called Alien Spy. I bring to class a collection of magazines and I ask students to imagine that they are spies from another planet whose only source of information on Earth's inhabitants is this small archive of magazines. One group might have fashion or celebrity magazines while others have outdoorsy, health, or animal-focused magazines. After responding to a series of questions that seek physical descriptions of earthlings, alongside speculation about their behaviors and beliefs, such as what do they eat, what makes them happy, what do they worship, they are asked to depict a typical earthling through collage or drawing. The results are often humorous. For example, one group decided that the most powerful creatures on Earth must be dogs, given their magazine featured ads showing humans following dogs around with pooper scoopers. I thought that was actually quite clever. <laughs> Mostly, however, they are poignant as they demonstrate the ways in which certain bodies are marginalized or erased. Other times, I pick out particular images to help them make specific connections. For example, to demonstrate the ways in which fat people are demonized in the environmental movement, I may show a newspaper front page with a headline that blared, Fatties Cause Global Warming, which obviously was the kickoff for my article in CJEE. Or I may show a cartoon of a fat woman sitting on the planet. Or any number of other images or cartoons that imply that fat people are ruining the planet. It is all my fault that we are going to hell in a handbasket. I love this cartoon. <laughs> I'll give you a second to read it. Yeah. One image that I found particularly powerful in demonstrating the intersection of sizeism, sexism, and speciesism is a billboard produced by People for the Ethical Treatment of Animals, that is, PETA. It depicts a cartoon image of a fat woman in a bikini on a beach with the tagline, save the whales, lose the blubber, go vegetarian. This billboard generated a forceful negative response and pull, PETA pulled it pretty quickly, but that does not mean that they've learned much from their experience. Rather, PETA President Ingrid Newkirk responded to the controversy by decrying the coddling of fat people who quote, 
shoveling food and haven't a clue, unquote. And she asserted that fat people need to have some discipline and remember that being fat means being a bad role model to our children. Yeah. So given such statements, it should come as no surprise that PETA continues to utilize fat shaming in their, in their campaigns. And here's a couple of recent ones. Fat studies scholar, are you guys still okay? I'm seeing uh, we're reacting. <laughs> okay, perfect. I just all of a sudden saw some hands. <laughs> all right. Okay. Fat study scholar Amy Farrell insightfully observes that, quote, PETA reduces their larger and much more complicated argument about animal ethics to an abhorrence of the fat body. Kristen Hardy, in her discussion of that infamous Lose the Blubber billboard, applauded the work of an artist and blogger named Christy, who created a parody ad in response. And she included a photograph of herself in a bikini with the words, I am vegetarian, but I am still a whale, alongside contact information for PETA so that others could register complaints, and lots of other people did so. Christy's slide is a good example of what is sometimes called ad busting. And like Marcia, I have found it helpful to have students move beyond deconstruction of media to engaging in media production themselves, whether through ad busting or producing collages, zines, videos, or blogs. I have also found food to be a generative topic of discussion in my teaching. In her analysis of campaigns that use fat shaming, and there's many of them, Amy Farrell rightfully asserts that food activists are aiming for one thing, but have hit another. They want a complex overhaul of our food systems, but they aim at readers' waistlines. And the very diet industrial system that food activists so abhor is strengthened, as fat denigration encourages people to turn to desperate measures to fight the stigma they experience. Kristen Hardy, whose research I mentioned earlier, is a fat vegan. And she too questions the fat phobic tactics used in some campaigns for plant-based diets. Nonetheless, she also recognizes how challenging it can be to discuss food choices such as meat eating within the fat activist movement, given their important critiques of and resistance to the cultural obsession with dieting. Hardy asserts, however, that these conversations need to happen. As she says, personal dietary choices are inherently embedded with issues of power and privilege. I agree, and I think that there's much potential in a critical food education that attends to both fat phobia and speciesism. For me, critical food education must include illuminating the horrifying conditions for both animals and human laborers in the factory farms and slaughterhouses responsible for much of the meat and dairy consumed by North Americans. While undoubtedly discomforting knowledge that many people would rather ignore, understanding how food animals live and die is necessary for making informed decisions. Further, as Carol Adams convincingly argues, feeling separate from and above certain animals enables, enables our industrialized exploitation of them. For example, imagining a fat cow as a stupid and docile animal makes it much easier to mistreat her in industrialized dairy production. I have firsthand experience with cows and pigs, given I grew up on a farm, and I know that common characterizations of them are often inaccurate. I thus consider it vital that I bring the lives of other animals into my teaching. I'm committing to demonstrating the complexity of various animals' lives and making clear that they too are subjects of their own lives and have intrinsic value. I want students to question the anthropocentric assumptions that undergird the insults they often casually throw about. And this brings us back to where I began this discussion, animal insults. Ana analyzing insults can be very revealing. In one activity I do, I ask students to brainstorm insults based on animals. So think fat cow, stupid bitch, snake, pussy, you get the picture. I close the classroom door so that they feel safer sharing these insults, particularly ones with swear words or that are quite offensive. 
And as they shout them out, I write the insults on the board. We then begin to group the insults together by target. For example, women, men, racialized people, fat people, fat women, to unpack the associations that often have sexist, racist, homophobic, ableist, and sizist undertones. We also unpack the assumptions being made about the animals in question. Insults like fat cow work in part because animal bodies, fat bodies, and female bodies are considered abject in much of contemporary Western culture. That is, they often evoke disgust. Writing about fat, Leslie Owen writes, and I quote, fat bodies live, they breathe, they sneeze, sweat, menstruate, eat, talk, drink, urinate, vomit, belch, and defecate. In fact, many bodies do every one of these things, but fat, similar to other abject bodies, are more regularly linked to them. Fat bodies are regarded as disgusting, in part because they are considered more biological, more tied to their processes, more tied to their orifices. Fat people are dirty, a word we tend to associate with coming into contact with bodies and nature." Unquote. Bringing together scholarship on objection from gender studies, critical animal studies, and fat studies has much to add to this conversation, I think. As a counterpoint, it is also important to make clear that there are always cracks in consent to hegemonic narratives that stigmatize. For example, Susan Stinson's poetry challenges the stigma that comes with being labeled a fat whale. As Amy Farrell notes, and I quote, Susan Stinson's poems celebrate the beauty and sensuality of the whale slipping through the water. It is no surprise that Stinson draws on the idea and image of the whale simultaneously rejecting the common insult and reclaiming the creature's beauty, finesse, and strength." Unquote. By challenging the speciesism underlying what are meant to be hurtful comparisons to whales and to other animals, the power of these insults is significantly diminished. So let's return to fat cow. Can we problematize and reclaim this insult? As fat acceptance advocates, activists and fat studies scholars have argued, the word fat need not be considered an insult, but rather as a simple descriptor of a body. Further, in my personal experience with cows, I know them to be curious, highly social, gentle, and fiercely protective mothers. So I think I can take cow as a compliment. I'm going to wrap up now with just a few questions that I see this work raising for environmental and sustainability education. I wonder, in what ways do we reproduce sexism, sizeism, and or speciesism in the environmental, animal, and social justice movements generally, and environmental and sustainability education specifically? I also wonder how analyses of objection, dehumanization, and animalization might help our work in environmental and sustainability education. I wonder what theoretical, pedagogical, and activist work can intersectional analyses such as these that include gender, body size, animality, and other axes of oppression enable. And finally, in the spirit of coalitional politics and solidarity, how might we better work with our kindred spirits and potential allies? So I'm going to stop here, and I'm very curious to hear your responses to these ideas and questions. So I now open the floor to you. Thanks so much, Bonnie. So uh, we're opening it up to questions now. I'm just going to make uh, your screen a little bit bigger. Uh, I was just going to go down to the people chat if they have a question. Yeah, sure. Maybe Teresa. Uh, I thought she was going for a while too, but then maybe she was at school and has to go. Yeah, yeah. I'll just check here. Oh, yeah, perfect. 
Okay. I can start. Um, thank you so much for that presentation. It was I've never heard of anything like it. It was very enlightening. So thank you so much. Gave me a lot to think about. Um, you mentioned that ecofeminism has kind of fallen out of favor. Uh, can you speak a little bit more about why that's happened? Yeah, that's a fabulous question. Um, I think that you know whenever ecofeminism first uh, came about, it, it was a it was an umbrella sort of concept, and there were lots of folks coming at it from different perspectives. Some folks had really essentialist positions, um, making connections between women and nature uh, that frankly were quite sexist in terms of that women were inherently closer to nature and men were not, um, and that essentialist sort of um, framing really did a disservice, I think, to the field and, and had a really simplistic understanding of gender. I also think some of uh, the variations of ecofeminism were pretty wacky. Um, there were some spiritual ones that uh, really turned off a lot of folks because they were sort of new agey and uh, the way in which they frame things just felt hokey to a lot of academics. So I think that because of some of those particular streams, ecofeminism just sort of got tossed out. I also think that their ideas were in fact taken up. So many of their ideas are now present in an intersectionality studies. Uh, but that's something that happens to feminism generally, right? In terms of feminists, for example, made excellent critiques of science, and then that history of where those critiques came from got erased, right? So people now question objectivity all the time and forget that it was feminists who first made uh, those observations and those important critiques. So I think there's also that dynamic going on that um, that notion of intersectionality is now present, but the fact that it was feminists who brought that to the fore has been lost. Same as environmental justice advocates were also at the forefront of those conversations, making very clear the connections between uh, race and class and um, uh, environmental destruction. And I would say that those have also been erased in some histories of intersectionality. Yeah, I had a quick question to ask you. So thank you so much for this entire presentation and a lot of, because I was a bigger kid, you know, a refractory kid, and a lot of experiences resonated with mine. So I just wanted to ask you two questions, although I don't know a lot of literature or theories in this area, if you could enlighten me about certain theories. So from whatever little knowledge I have, of BMI. In my, I think it's a, more of a mathematical concept, which a mathematician has sometimes uh, invented to study non-body, you know, and how it came to the concept of choosing body. And another thing is that, is it something uh, promoted like a sign of a perfect body or size zero phenomena? Is it something that is being promoted by the uh, popular culture or was it the way it is? I mean, in general, I don't see a lot of women in general who are not spending a lot of time on makeup or taking care of their body 24-7. I mean, nobody is, looks like one of those beautiful images that you showed on the uh, thing, you know. And I really want that how can we pass it on to a second generation that it's more important to be fit and uh, not be obsessed with how you look on your exterior side. So. That was something if you could give me any leads on it. Yeah, those are excellent questions. So there's been a writing on the history of BMI, and it was, you're right, a mathematical formula that was used in insurance industries. Uh, to predict, um, it was for sort of actuarial purposes, and it's highly simplistic and been uh, criticized because, in fact, it doesn't measure much, right? So, um, for example, working with Erin Cameron, she is classified as overweight, heading towards obese, uh, according to BMI, but she was an athletic, um, she was an Olympic athlete, she was a bicyclist, you know, with like really fabulous thighs, 
you know, but because of those fabulous thighs, she was declared obese, you know, or overweight. Um, it just doesn't take into context at all sort of the ways in which our bodies are quite different. So just a simple calculation between height and weight doesn't tell you much. Uh, and it doesn't uh, tell you much in terms of behaviors, right? In terms of you can look at me and go, oh, she must be lazy and never work out, not knowing, you know, that I box or that I do whatever, right? So it just it, it's so simplistic. But I think that that's why, in fact, it has been adopted um, because it's just so easy to use. So there's 20 gazillion BMI scales on the Internet, so you can calculate your BMI like that. So I think that it's ease of use um, has been very helpful. And, and I think that it has become, you know, if you're thinking about Foucault, this way of um, self-policing oneself, right, to be constantly weighing oneself and calculating your BMI and, you know, that self-monitoring is something that, you know, women experience. So do men. You know, I, I certainly am seeing lots of young men now who are quite concerned that they don't have rock hard abs, um, you know, even though, you know, only a small percentage of men can, can develop those re relatively easily. Uh, so it's certainly impacting men as well as women. But I think that uh, in a patriarchal culture where women's um, beauty matters more than any other aspect of them, um, we are, we're facing that, right? So I'm just horrified to think that, you know, seven-year-olds are on a diet. Uh, and that just, like, just blows my mind. Uh, and just horrified to just it, – it's worse than even when I was a kid, right? Like, you know, I remember being very self-conscious about my body – but not to the point that I see young women now. And I think that that's partially because I, you know, rural area, we only got two television channels. <laughs> you know, maybe I was just a little less marinated in it. Um, but now I just, I just watch the young women in my classrooms and how self-conscious so many of them are. And so I do think that we've got a lot of work to do. And that really is partially what fat pedagogy is about, right? It, it's for um, all people, right? Fat, thin, male, female, in terms of our obsession with our bodies um, versus, you know, all these other parts of ourselves that we should be proud of and, and celebrating is hugely a problem. And I think that uh, we've spent, you know, so much time focusing on such superficial things. I don't care if women wear makeup or run around in high heels or wear a hijab, you know, to get into the politics of the day here in Canada. <laughs> you know, it's not my business to tell women what to wear. I want them to be able to express themselves in whatever way makes sense to them. Uh, but I think that obviously we're, whenever you're marinated in a culture that says that uh, you have to look a certain way and dress a certain way, um, it's hugely problematic and that's, the intersection of feminist pedagogy and, and fat ped pedagogy, I would say. Thank you so much. Uh, if I may, I'll follow along that same line. Connie, again, thank you so much for the presentation. It was really good to bring these issues that you don't really hear about to light. And uh, actually, I was reading an article the other day about youth engagement and sustainability, and one of the findings was that women are closer to nature, but still they have more they're more engaged in this kind of thing, and it sort of highlighted the fact that women are closer and men are more disengaged than nature. So I thought yeah. that was interesting that you brought that up. But I, I was actually going to ask you, um, you may or may not have seen them. I also only have the two Farmer Vision channels, but on TV these days, they have those uh, commercials that the one is so disturbing. It's about a seven-year-old, like she's really young and she has those magazines in front of her of thin bodies and she has a pair of scissors holding her stomach and she's trying to cut her stomach. It is the most, like I, I hate it. It makes me so upset. And then there's, on the flip side of that, so that's part of the one commercial, I can't remember, but it's like um, Special K or those, yeah. it's like a food company who's going on this big push now to get rid of this dieting thing and there's also the one where it's a whole bunch of women's bums and how we dislike our bodies. So I'm just wondering about your opinion on the new ads that are coming out from interesting places like a cereal company that are trying to push this agenda forward. 
Yeah, that's an excellent question because I haven't seen that one about a girl cutting her stomach, so that's quite disturbing. Um, but I have seen some of the other ones. There's a lot from Dove, Special K, and um, what's the other one? There's a – oh, yeah, there's another one in the States. I can't remember. Anyway, it doesn't matter. But, yeah, I think that there's a recognition that there is a demographic, that fat people still have to clothe themselves and eat uh, so that uh, – I think that in a capitalist economy, some people are seeing a marketing niche, sort of going for that. Um, but I think that some of what happens is that uh, these attempts, and I actually laud attempts, right? Like we do need to try and disrupt um, ideas about body image. So it's great to see heavier models and Dove trying to celebrate um, different bodies, but they never have 300 pound bodies either, right? Like it's usually folks who are slightly overweight, you know, they usually don't have folks who are, you know, considerably heavier. And I think that's a problem. So there's a um, a clothes company in the U.S. Uh, called Lane Bryant, and they've been uh, advertising. And so they were having this big promotion, but then they only had um, – t-shirts available at this promotion that came in extra large and of course all the women who were like 2x or 3x couldn't get couldn't actually get t-shirts because they actually weren't welcome right you could be overweight but only so overweight so there's still i think um you know it's still there right it's not quite a full fat acceptance and so i think the fat acceptance movement is trying to push at those boundaries and there's huge debates in the field because um you know you'll have some people say well what is the limit when are you hot problematic is it 300 pounds is it 400 pounds so there's those sorts of discussions that come up with fat acceptance folks saying you know we shouldn't even be having that sort of argument and there's debates in the field about what is the role of weight science. Is there a certain weight by which you probably are unhealthy? And some folks will say, you know, we shouldn't even be having those conversations. Those conversations just reproduce the oppression. And other folks saying, well, we shouldn't discount it entirely. Um, so those are just parts of the debate in the field because it is a pretty new field. And in terms of the women in nature stuff, yeah, I still see it all the time uh, that – uh, women are somehow inherently closer, and I think there's all sorts of reasons for that. Um, there's a really good book by Sherilyn McGregor, and I'm not going to remember the name of it, but it's talking about, oh, Mothering Earth, I think is what it's called, and it's just talking about how um, how that can be used, right, in terms of by saying that women are closer to nature, then we get to also be nature's janitors, that it's our job to clean up the mess because, you know, we clean things up at home, so we should clean things up outside too. Uh, so she does a really interesting analysis of, of what sort of work Mother Nature discourse does and what sort of work um, conflating women and, and nature together does. And, and as I said, it's simplistic in terms of gender and I think offensive in terms of all the males who are out there doing fabulous work too. Thank you. <laughs> um, thanks so much, Connie. Um, I uh, was just wondering, going back to your questions that you had on your last slide, in terms of kind of looking at environmental and sustainability education, um, and I just was thinking about it in terms of the, the research field, too. Um, I know we talked about that in relation to gender, but bringing these other intersectionalities in as well, just, um, kind of any reflections that you have on kind of issues or uh, responses um, or, you know, interventions or places for growth for the research field around these intersections? Yeah, I think that's a, a great question that you and I have had for many years now <laughs> in terms of how, you know, and you and I have debated about uh, what it means whenever we say that certain voices have been marginalized. And you know what, Marcia, as I've been working with you and Teresa on that bibliography, there has, in fact, been a lot written in feminist environmental ed or gender and environmental ed. So it, it's interesting to me in terms of my perception that it's been marginalized, but I think it's because it, it doesn't always get taken up in terms of there's a small group of us doing this work but it doesn't always get taken up by other folks in the field. And so I think that, um, you know, one thing is uh, just have to keep at it, right? <laughs> just keep 
talking about these issues, raising these issues. And I think, for example, the special issue or perhaps special issues of Journal of Environmental Ed on gender, like it was fabulous to see the response and the number of abstracts we got. So that's really encouraging. So I think that are we at a moment in time where people really are seeing the connections between environmental and social justice? I think so. I do see more recognition. I also see more folks from beyond environmental and sustainability education being interested in these issues. When I was a PhD student at OIV, you know, 20 years ago, uh, I was, you know, like a person from another planet to want to be raising issues about environment and animals and in fact was often treated quite badly by some people who said, you know, until we have human issues sorted out, we don't want to be hearing about this. Um, whereas now I see folks, and that was in critical pedagogy circles, just to be clear, <laughs> and now I see a lot of crit ped folks willing to engage, um, you know, and maybe that is about climate change. Maybe there's just a recognition that, okay, maybe things those folks were talking about actually, you know, were true and that we need to think about it. So I hope that we're ready to start seeing those connections. And I really hope that we're at a moment where we can start having conversations beyond the field. Like I think it has been important in environmental ed to, to be as a field building up our um, ideas and our practices, but I think we obviously need to read beyond the field. We need to work with people beyond the field, and I think many of us do, right? We do in our activist lives or in our social lives, in our lives in the university hallways, and I think we need to continue that and maybe be a bit more proactive about who we're talking to so that we're not just preaching to the converted. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So thank you again for your um, talk. It was very um, challenging and, you know, just very eye-opening for me. Um, so I've been reading quite a bit of literature about intersectionality and just wondering, to get back on what Mercy was asking, how do we, like, because there's an article that I was reading that was talking about, people talking about um, class, gender, race, uh, and other Right. Yeah. So, with that, like, how? So, what falls? How do we capture what falls in that otherness? <laughs> and how do we bring those connections together? Um, and um, my other question is, in terms of your experience speaking, because it's given us a bit of uh, strategies that you use in class. How has the reception been? Uh, what pushback have you gotten? How do you deal with those? And then how? Because given, given coming from Kenya, we don't really. I mean, being fat is good. I know. You know? Yeah. I, I went home and my mom was like, "Oh my gosh, what's happening to you? You need to eat." You know. So, so being fat as a woman is actually considered good. You know, people love that. But coming here and those resources are kind of being fat here is really on the bottom. I have stories of my friends telling me that my dad friends are like. Telling you, oh, I like you're fat. And they're all like, ah. you know? So here, it's their friends, you know? But, <laughs> I know. <laughs> I know. Exactly, the you know? Um, but in large not say that. You know? To you know? so a girl in here, you know, because it's on the fun. But very slowly, those discourses are coming to our Kenyan media, you know, our African TV, and now we're. I went home and all these ads about losing weight and taking the field and all this craziness. You know, so I'm just wondering how um, colors, or like what kind of work you've encountered with international colors and how did they even deal with their things? Do they talk about these issues? And, um, <laughs> yeah, I'll do it. I think you can ask me another one if you want. So, yeah, I totally, I, I love that you brought up Kenya. So, I did a uh, on my last sabbatical, I actually was in Kenya for a couple of months, and I was with a PhD student uh, who would, in in you know Canadian culture, would be seen as you know beautifully gorgeous. For those folks who know Sue Hamill, she's beautiful, and and we're there, and it's me who's being hit on all the time, right? And it's like it's like. I'm moving to Kenya, right? <laughs> and it was. It was really eye-opening for me because I'd never been in a culture 
where, you know, fat was seen as status because it meant I had enough to eat and I was healthy and, you know, and that there were fat women as pinup models, you know, and that can be problematic too, clearly, but, but it was just so different. Um, and I have, in talking to some Kenyans, I have also heard what you've said that um, that's changing, that, uh, you know, in terms of colonization or um, globalization that, you know, Western beauty ideals, and, and that totally saddens me to hear that uh, happening. So I think that um, that global perspective is really important, and some folks in fat studies, scholar uh, fat studies, do point to that because there's also differences in American black culture, uh, Hawaiian culture, indigenous culture, so there are differences in terms of what counts as beautiful. Uh, and so trying to actually highlight those and make those more clear helps demonstrate that beauty ideals are culturally and historically specific, right? Uh, so that's helpful. But I think that so much of the writing right now in fat studies and in fat pedagogy is still very much um, a Western phenomenon, so that needs to expand. I think that there's lots of very helpful insights uh, to be had from other contexts. Um, in terms of student reception, beyond some students being like horrified that I call myself fat, because they're like, no, you're not, like, uh, look at me, yeah, I am, you know, but it's just they're trying to be polite and complimentary because they think, oh my god, you're insulting yourself and thinking I'm fishing for a compliment or something, right? So, you know, we actually explicitly talk about that, that if somebody responds that way, what does that mean, what they're doing? Um, and frankly, I've found that the majority of students respond really well. The ones who don't have been trained in kinesiology and want to be phys ed teachers. I think they're just so embedded in, um, you know, having a trainable fit body that it's particularly challenging for them. So, you know, I've also seen lots of movement amongst those folks as they've gotten to know more about it, but there's often more resistance there. Uh, but generally, I find uh, students quite, um, yeah, open to it because it, it obviously, even if they're not fat themselves, they're often struggling with their own body or working really, really, really hard to get, you know, either, you know, the six pack or to stay thin. And so they're experiencing weight-based oppression too, it's just their body looks different than mine, but it is still the same um, process that's happening. So I think that they're, I, I know, because they tell me that they just find it sort of mind-blowing and really um, freeing. That doesn't mean, though, that, you know, my one little class, they still have to go back into, you know, wider society. And um, nonetheless, it has helped many of them and not just, you know, sort of the fat kids. Next question. Yeah, Jennifer. And if we have time, we'll I was just wondering if uh, entering into this dialogue about weight-based oppression, if it helps with the students understand other forms of oppression that you might be talking about in your class. So as you talk about how you get these become constructed to say that these bodies have value because they're seen as normal and healthy and so forth, these bodies don't have value because they're seen as abnormal, less than and therefore easier to direct violence towards. Uh, those kinds of things are similar to racism and classism and so forth. And I'm just wondering if you find that easier than to enter into those other dialogues when you're talking about this initially? Yeah, no, that's a fabulous question. I think that, um, actually, all the questions have been fabulous. This is great, thank you. Um, I think that there's sort of two sides to this story. On one side, me talking about weight-based oppression is is harder because I'm fat. So some folks will see me as, oh, I'm just whining about the fact that, you know, people insult me sometimes, right? And so just like it's much harder to uh, do any racist work when you're a racialized person or feminist work when you're a female, you know, there sometimes can be some resistance that, that way, right? And so when I have been doing work with some of my thin allies, sometimes they'll be heard more than me as they're talking about weight beta suppression. But then we actually talk about that in terms of what does it mean when the body of the messenger um, shares the oppression you're talking about. 
Um, on the flip side, I actually do think because people are so interested in body image and weight, and I just find young folks in particular, but really people of all ages are so interested, it is a really good entree. For some reason, it feels um, less charged than talking about racism. I find that my students are much more willing to acknowledge their thin privilege than their white privilege. White privilege, at least in my context, is really, really hard uh, for a lot of students. So I find that, you know, you're right. I can, if I can get them thinking about weight-based oppression and then start to make those connections, I think it can help. Just like um, sometimes there's huge resistance to sexism, right, those discussions. Uh, because I have lots of young women who, you know, cannot call themselves feminists, just think that, you know, it's, it's a horrible word and there's no such thing as sexism anymore. Um, you know, so there's resisted in all sorts of places to talking about that. So if I can hook them in with discussions of one, then it can help in discussions of the other. Thank you. Thanks so much, Connie. It's uh, been a pleasure to host you here at Siri and, uh, Great conversation. Uh, so you're welcome to join us if you like. Uh, on the uh, <laughs> online for, uh, for the snack. Sure. <laughs> <All right. laughs> thanks. Thanks so much again. But uh, hopefully I'll see a few of you at ARA in Washington. Yes. For sure. Yeah. Um, okay. Bye bye. 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 Bye